Don't miss Kohl's 50% off sale going on now. You'll find 50% off throughout the store Thursday through Saturday. Like 50% off sweaters and outerwear for the family. And everyone gets $10 Kohl's cash for every $50 spent. Plus, Kohl's Yes to You rewards members. Take an extra 20% off and earn triple points. Not a member? Enroll at Kohl's.com forward slash rewards and start earning today. Kohl's. Select styles. Some exclusions apply. See store or Kohl's.com for details. Blog Talk Radio. Paranormal Review Radio. Welcome, everyone. It's Friday night, and you're listening to Paranormal Review Radio, the only radio show without commercials and with more great paranormal talk. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm Lucy Wiefried in Chicago, and usually by this time we have Anthony Agati with us, but Anthony's not going to be joining us tonight. Um, He has some family obligations. Um, it is his niece, Miliana's birthday, and we all want to wish Miliana a wonderful birthday, and let's, <laughs> let's have some fun in the meantime, okay? Now, you are listening to one of the highest-rated paranormal radio shows on Blog Talk. No bull, no lies, just a true platform for everyone to share their knowledge and experiences when searching for truth. Good communication is key. Now, our phone lines are open for questions or stories. The call-in number is 661-244-9831. The chat room is also open, so you can type in your questions and comments as well. Don't forget to like us on Facebook and subscribe to our YouTube channel at Paranormal Review Radio. You'll find more articles, blogs, and full show uploads. And if you have specific questions, comments, or would like to be a guest on the show, email us at paranormal.review at AOL.com. So, sit back, get comfy, and prepare to open your minds. It's time for Paranormal Review Radio. Okay, paranormal investigating, it's not exactly what you see on television, It occasionally yields evidence or even signs of paranormal existence. But beyond the hours of actual investigating, the research done before and after happens to be the most critical steps when setting foot into a haunted location. Research on the paranormal, research on the location, and research into the evidence must be analyzed with a skeptical view and critical mindset. Not everything is the paranormal you really Not everything is the paranormal, and you really need to have a special gift in order to to distinguish the normal from the paranormal. Our guest tonight has that gift, and he has 20 years to prove it. Richard Estep is a paranormal investigator, researcher, and author that has been searching for ghostly activity on both sides of the Atlantic. He has written a book that is the first volume of his autobiography called in search of the paranormal. Now, from exploring the Tower of London to investigating a haunted Colorado firehouse, paranormal researcher Richard Estep takes you behind the scenes for an up-close and personal encounter with a fascinating legion of hauntings. Now, this collection reveals some of the most chilling, captivating, and weird cases that Richard has investigated over the past 20 years, both in England and in the United States. In Search of the Paranormal is filled with rich historical detail, present-day research, and compelling eyewitness accounts. So let's find out about these haunted locations, both here in the States and overseas. Who 
please help me in welcoming Richard to the show. Welcome, Richard. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Good evening. It is a pleasure to be here. You know what? Um, you're originally from Syston, Leicestershire in the UK, and you're now a resident in Colorado. Um, did you find a big difference in paranormal culture after you moved to the States? Well, then I'm pronouncing Leicestershire correctly. That's usually one that gets mangled. Um, <laughs> you know, I, I think that the culture, the paranormal culture is similar now. Um, mm -hmm. I do think there's been a big change since I've left the UK in 1999 and came to the US, I think that the paranormal culture globally has changed. And I think mm -hmm. that that's because when I left, we did not have, um, here in the States, ghost hunters, and there in the UK, most haunted. So I think mm -hmm. that is, that really separates the um, kind of before and after um, eras, if you will. Mm -hmm. Well, can you tell us what led you to the paranormal? And how did you begin investigating? Well, I think like everybody else, it's always been an area of fascination for me. Um, and everybody loves a good ghost story, don't they? Especially at this time of year. Uh -huh. I always used to take it one step further, though, and I would, I would check out all of the books in my library's um, paranormal research section, and I would just devour those when I was a kid. And my, my parents and grandparents were kind enough. They would keep buying books on this subject, and it just fascinated me from an early age. So I always wanted to um, to visit some of these locations I'd read about. And my grandparents' house was, was haunted, um, but not when I was staying there. It was haunted when my um, stepfather uh, was a child, was a young man. And he and his family had an experience where he and his uh, brothers and sisters were getting uh, tucked into bed at night by a ghostly old lady. Um, a female apparition that seemed very maternal and very protective of the children in the house. And so I used to, I would hear those stories and, and they would terrify and fascinate me in equal measure. And staying in that house, I remember lying awake at night, half hoping I would run into her and half hoping that I wouldn't. But she had long moved on um, when I was resident at her house. So did you have any kind of experiences growing up yourself? Actually not. Um, I would wish to, but I didn't. None, none whatsoever, other than the fascination of reading about it and studying it. And I've only had a relative few that have happened to me personally as an adult been related to investigations. Okay. So I'm not someone that is sensitive or or what you would call, you know, a paranormal magnet at all. I'm quite mm -hmm. the opposite. Mm-hmm. Well, you know what, I did hear you in an interview, and you were talking about the equipment that you and your team use while you're investigating. Um, you did make a statement that really struck a, struck a chord with me, and how about how when paranormal research first began in the Victorian area, how they primarily used a pencil, a notepad, and a keen mind. Now, mm -hmm. do you feel that we're relying too much on modern equipment now when we investigate other than with our senses? I think that is 100% the case. If you look at the true great investigators throughout history, you know, um, you have guys like uh, Harry Price, um, you have investigators like Sir Arthur Conan Doyle and Sir Oliver Lodge. They were scientists, but they were pushing at the frontier of this new science, and it still is a science that's in its infancy. And I mm -hmm. think it's very tempting, especially after you watch certain shows on TV, there is nothing to stop anybody from dropping 30 bucks on an EMF meter or as many gadgets as they want to buy and then not really understanding how best to apply them or employ them and just calling themselves a paranormal investigator, you know? And it's mm -hmm. kind of a thrill-seeking hobby for a lot of people. And yet you really have to put in the background work. You have to put in the research. You have to put in the non-glamorous but crucial um, investigative um, steps before you get anywhere near a paranormal investigation. And most of that is done with, with deductive reasoning and keen thinking. Mm -hmm. Well, that's one of the things that we always say, you know, Anthony and I, when we investigate, you know, it's that it's not just going to the location with the equipment. I mean, as you said, I mean, you uh, you have to really research the location, research the, the area, research 
the actual building or location that you're in. You have to look at not just the location itself, but the ground. You know, what is the area like? What is the the site like? It may be a, a modern housing complex or a residence now, but what was it 50, 100, 200, um, 300 years ago? You know, and that can mm-hmm. be quite a complex process looking at land titles and records. And I also, in the case of private residences, I like to know how many times that house has changed hands over the past few years because it's very telling, isn't it, when you see a location has nobody has rented it or owned it for more than a year or two without moving out kind of abruptly. Mm-hmm. You well, know, you know so what? It can, it can, yeah, go ahead. No, 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 go ahead, dear. I was going to say it can be very kind of suggestive, can't it, if, if a tenant will not stay in a location for any great length of time. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm Cherokee Indian, so I do come from a background that does believe that the land remembers things, that things that can happen years, hundreds of years ago can still have an effect on activity today. So that's one of the things that I put in place when we do go investigating. We both do. I mean, we, we, we both really pay attention to the land, pay attention to the area, the history, um, the locations that we've done here in the States. Um, you know, what kind what Indian tribes were there. And I find a lot of times there is that connection, not only with the present, but with the past. I think that, that that's undeniable. The, the things we do tend to have consequences that can go on for many years. And you only have to look at places here in the United States, like Gettysburg, where you had this massive clash of armies. You had over one weekend, more American lives were lost than during the entire Vietnam War and in this very small space, relatively speaking. And I believe that scars the location. Um, mm-hmm. and, it, and it still echoes. You just look at the paranormal activity that's going on in Gettysburg today, and it, I believe it echoes down over the years. And under the correct circumstances and the correct mindset, um, if everything aligns properly, we can still pick up on it. I'm so glad you mentioned mindset. I think a lot of people nowadays from what they see on TV, what they read about, they just go into it and they think, okay, hey, I'm going to find a ghost. And that's not always the case. It's not. And I think, honestly, a paranormal explanation is always the last one we should reach for. And I think we we so easily do in this field jump to that explanation. But there are so many things that have to be ruled out before you could even mm-hmm. approach a paranormal explanation. Well, I want to get into your book, okay, and, and it's called In Search of the Paranormal. Um, mm-hmm. I finished this book in one evening. I thought it was really, really very interesting, and it was a great oh, read. Thank you. And I really highly, you know, recommend that everybody pick it up and, take, uh, you know, read it. Um, I'll, we'll be posting a, a link to um, where you can pick up the book. But one of the locations that you do mention in the book and on the cover is the mm-hmm. Hammer House murder in Denver, Colorado. What's mm-hmm. the mystery behind this case? Can you share a, a little bit about the investigation? Well, this was an interesting case because I can't give the address, obviously. But the, the story behind it in brief was that a friend of mine who I worked with at the fire department, a fellow firefighter, had purchased this house for, for a pretty decent price because one of the former occupants had been beaten to death with a hammer. Um, and he wanted to convert this into a series of um, condos, you know. And he said, here's the problem. It's that house in the neighborhood. It has ghost stories attached to it. You know, people tell stories about the place, and I really don't think that's going to help my chances of of being a successful landlord. So would you come investigate and see if there's anything to the story? So really he was asking me to come in and try and rule out uh, a possible haunting. Um, and so my team spent the night there. We did investigate the place, and we could not find any evidence to support um, the, the stories of the place being haunted at all. And so we really were able to do them a service. Um, and it's amazing. Most people want us to validate a haunting. He wanted the opposite. And I've run into a couple of cases like that where a place has a reputation, perhaps unfairly, um, and we'll go in and we'll see if we can or cannot find something paranormal going on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times uh, a location might have a reputation and 
sometimes it just ends up being the house or just maybe the stories itself. And we've talked about this a couple times. You know, when someone investigates, it's almost like we want to see something or we want to experience something so badly that it's possible that we are creating what we're experiencing. Do you ever feel that that's the case? I do. It's kind of like a self-fulfilling prophecy, isn't it? And the danger is that I think we all are in this field um, because we want to believe in this kind of stuff, to quote Agent Mulder. We really want to believe, and that's the most dangerous thing because it is so easy to find evidence which validates something you already want to be true. So you have to really raise the bar and be a little bit more skeptical and say, well, wait a minute. Um, And it requires real integrity and a real effort of will to do that. You know, to say, I think that this is just an old house. I think the stories may just be stories. But I would also, on the flip side, say that you have to spend quite an amount of time in any building like that before you, there's nothing going on either. We all know that there are haunted places, haunted people, and haunted um, objects. I'm still not sure why people see ghosts or how they see ghosts, what those mechanisms are. So it may just be that the investigative team isn't in the right place at the right time with the right mindset, with the right people, with the right weather, and the, you know, the various other variables that all have to line up before somebody experiences something paranormal. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, there's a line in your book that I did find very interesting. And to quote, as a quick aside, phantoms of the living are not heard of. There are plenty of documented cases in the paranormal case literature that detail apparitions of people who are not actually dead, but they rarely appear within sight of the physical person themselves and are certainly not at the same time. Now, what did you mean by phantoms of the living, and have you ever encountered one? Um, I haven't encountered a phantom of the living, although my own might have been heard, and I'll talk about that in a second. But I can tell you that if you read the literature, especially when the SPR, the Society for Psychical Research, was doing um, extensive studies around the turn of the century, the last uh, century, I should say, late 1800s, early 1900s, and and then, of course, the big spiritualism craze in the aftermath of the First World War, they found hundreds, if not thousands, of reports of phantoms of people who had not yet died. So they were seen in places where they actually weren't at that time, and then would come along perfectly well, not have died. And and so, really, it was a ghost. We tend to associate ghost sightings with dead people. Um, and yet, mm-hmm. that is not always the case. Um, in my uh, experience, I was at Waverly Hills with my team a few months ago, um, and I was up on the roof at the time with several of my investigators. And if you've ever been to Waverly Hills, it's a pretty tall structure. You know the sanatorium. And mm-hmm. there is a death tunnel, they call it the death tunnel. It's a long chute um, which supposedly bodies were taken down um, to hearse it from. So it's the ground at quite a steep angle. And two of the female investigators were heading toward the death tunnel, and they heard me talking in there, my voice. And I have an American team, so I have the only British accent on that team. And they were convinced that they could hear my voice specifically talking from halfway up to death, the death tunnel. Um, uh-huh. And I was on the roof at the time with multiple witnesses. And Waverly Hills is renowned for doppelganger-type activity where people are seen appearing where they couldn't possibly be or heard as if they're being mimicked in places where they actually aren't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's fascinating. I mean, I've read stories about that. I've never experienced it myself. But that is interesting, you know, where you hear, uh, you know, I've heard of hearing voices of someone who is around you in in the places, but I've never experienced that. I've never found that. And you know what? Honestly, I think that would probably be a little bit more frightening than you know just a just a, a um, disembodied voice. I mean, to me, that just seems a little bit more frightening. When when I'd heard that this lady was, she's very level-headed, her name is Karen, she's very level-headed, and she was accompanied by a fellow investigator, and, and they're not fanciful individuals at all, but they were adamant that they could identify my voice. And that did send a, a chill down my spine as if something were imitating me in a place. Um, although, again, I had been in the death tunnel several hours before, 
So I also did kind of wonder, is there maybe a natural recording process going on? Because we do have those ghost um, experiences, which do seem to be like video or audio recordings made naturally in the environment. And I kind of wondered, was that what was going on? That I wasn't so much being imitated as my actual voice was somehow being played back. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, just a little bit, just to, to change the subject just a tiny bit. You know, you talk about you working with your team, and when me and Anthony investigate, we don't we don't have a team. It's usually just me and him, and you know that comes from part of the experience of having a team. We did have one at one time, and it just just didn't work out. And we found that mm-hmm. you know when we go by ourselves together, it's a much more rewarding experience. But okay. In your opinion, what do you find that is most lacking in paranormal groups these days? What is most lacking? Uh, Mm -hmm. That is interesting. I think it depends on the team's philosophy. Um, And and the more diverse of the team that you have, I think the more rounded it is. So I I have a fairly small team. We have just around 10 people, um, but we're a pretty diverse bunch. Uh, we come from various aspects of the professional world, the sciences, um, and, and the healthcare fields. And I think that we have an electrician, we have a computer engineer, we have a paramedic, firefighter that is myself, um, we have a web designer. You know, we have a pretty diverse field, a former telecoms engineer, people that can cover various aspects. We have a PhD in um, uh, the religious field also. So I think diversity mm-hmm. is important, and you've got to have room for, if not conflicting viewpoints on your team, you've got to have a healthy um, respect for the devil's advocate. You know, somebody that's mm-hmm. willing to say, well, hang on a minute, guys, maybe we haven't considered this explanation yet. The, somebody that's willing to question the evidence and and kind of try and poke holes in it, if you will. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I agree totally. I mean, between me and Anthony, Anthony is the one that is more of the the skeptical mind, and I'm the one that runs in there, and I'm like, it's a ghost, and this is somebody, and I've connected. So I do understand that he's the one that keeps my, my feet on the ground, but it works well because we've got both sides of it. I'm the one that's very open, and I'm looking for it. And Anthony on the other side, yes, he does believe, and he is looking for that. But he is a little bit more skeptical and a little bit more um, realistic about what we're experiencing. And I suspect that, as in so many other things in life, the truth lies somewhere in the middle. You need that mix of skepticism and belief um, in order to reach a healthy um, balance, a happy medium, pardon the pun. I know a few happy well, mediums. <laughs> well, you know what? I have totally been fascinated by England for as long as I can remember. And this year, I just had my first visit to London. And oh, cool. I did I did have, you know, I, I was able to go to Westminster Abbey and the Tower. And I did mm-hmm. feel a couple presences while I was in Westminster Abbey. And in oh, particular, and you know, that's my wife's favorite building in all of London. Who were the presences oh, I, you thought you picked up on? I, you know what, honestly, I felt Anne Neville. Um, it was near her her tomb, and mm-hmm. I just felt the sadness and the loss. I mean, it's like what I was getting was definitely she's still searching for love. I, I just, you know, I'm very fascinated with the period of history, you know, from Henry VIII up to Elizabeth the First. I'm totally mm-hmm. fascinated by that. And, you know, going into the, the Abbey, you know, there's so much there and you feel so much. But for mm-hmm. me in particular, Anne Neville, when I was around her tomb, that's where I felt. Uh, I felt a lot. You know, the other presence that I felt, of course, was Elizabeth the um, First. It was in her area where um, where her tomb is, where her and her sister are buried together. Mm-hmm. And um, I kind of had a little bit of expectation because I had some friends that had been there before. And he had mentioned that when he tried to touch the tomb, that he was he felt a burst of energy that kind of like pushed him back. Me, with that in mind, when I got into the area, I asked permission to be able to touch. You know, I usually do that. Um, one of the things that we do uh, do when we investigate, we're very respectful. You know, it's usually, Mm -hmm. I have this mindset that it's like, you know, I am going into their area, so therefore I need to.
to be respectful, ask permission um, in order to connect. And that's one of the things that I did. I had asked Elizabeth if I could touch her tomb. Well, she allowed me to do it. And I just had this very feeling of how powerful this woman is. I still feel that she is watching over uh, the Abbey. And it's just an amazing experience. I mean, it is one of the places that I'm so glad. And it really wasn't high on my list. I was more fascinated by the tower and other locations. But when I got to Westminster, Uh. I spent the whole day there by myself, just wandering around and just absorbing Mm -hmm. everything that is there. It is a beautiful and spirit-filled place, I feel. It it is wonderful, and and we usually go back and visit the Abbey every couple of years. Um, It has ghost stories. There is a a monk by the name of Father Ignatius that Mm -hmm. is known to to haunt the Abbey. And what's interesting about him is he always appears to be completely solid, and he interacts with visitors. In fact, more than one tourist has engaged him in conversation, thinking he was a real man. Um, And the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, which is also uh, in the Abbey, um, the figure mm-hmm. of uh, a forlorn male spirit from the First World War era is seen standing by the tomb. Of course, we don't know who's buried in there. Um, mm-hmm. But if you're looking for a good read, um, a book that I loved as a child has just been reprinted. It's called The Third Twin. It's by a man called John Ray, uh, R-A-E, John Ray. And he was the mm-hmm. headmaster of Westminster School. And he wrote a book for his children, this book, The Third Twin, and it is about all of the ghosts in the Abbey coming alive at night. They come out of their tombs, and they basically all get together. And uh, because of a, a plan to open the Abbey up 24 hours a day, they have their own little rebellion. It's a great book. It's a kid's book called The Third Twin, and I highly recommend it. Oh, God, I have to pick that up. I mean, I, I devour anything I can on England and, and the locations. But another, the I want to mention the tower, because you said that mm-hmm. when you had gone there that you'd fallen in love with the tower. Uh, oh, yeah. I mean, this location has such a bloody and dark history, and you do feel it once you set foot into the location. And in particular, my experience was not so much in the Tower Green. It wasn't anywhere else. It was in the chapel of St. Peter at Ventula. And I personally, I didn't realize that this isn't part of the usual tours that the Tower gives. I just happened to be on the Tower Green, and I heard the yeoman bringing a group by. And they were... They were gathered right outside the chapel. And he says, okay, and now we're going to go in there. So I just happened to slip in to the group mm. and was able to go inside there. Um, you were fortunate. My... It's a special treat, usually. <laughs> oh, my God. It was just going into the chapel because of my fascination with Anne Boleyn and the wives was really, really, it was amazing. And that was one of the things that I'd gone to the tower. I really wanted to connect with Anne. Well, the presence that I felt in there was not Anne. I actually felt um, St. Thomas more, more than anything. And that is one thing that I was totally aware of. You know, I I actually recorded the yeoman's, uh, his talk, and I know you're not Mm -hmm. supposed to take pictures there, but I did. And I do have one picture of the altar where the spot where Anne is supposed to, her bones are supposed to be, that there's this beautiful glowing light that is seen around the altar. I mean, this is so amazing. It's such an amazing place. So I really wanted to ask you, um, can you tell us a little bit more about the Tower's Ghosts and what maybe you or other people have experienced there? Well, certainly, and my favorite story about the chapel of St. Peter at Vincula um, is rather historic, but of course, the chapel, I'm sorry, the tower itself has always had a strong military presence. Um, the Duke of Wellington built a barracks there, and there have, there have always been soldiers. They still perform the ceremony of the keys um, every night in conjunction with the yeoman warders. So, you know, there, there has always been an army presence there. And the army sentries over the um, centuries have experienced a number of the tower's ghosts, including a headless woman, uh, which is theorized to be Anne Boleyn. Um, and a great, which seems an odd thing to, to appear as an apparition, but um, exotic animals were once part of the tower's time as a zoo. In fact, 
um, you could pay to get into the tower a couple of hundred years ago if you brought, instead of money, a dog or a cat to be fed to the animals. Uh, it's horrible oh, wow. to think of it now, but yeah, um, it's absolutely true. And uh, that chapel, St. Peter Advincula, one night an army officer happened to be making his rounds and he saw a light coming from those, those windows. And so he was curious and, and decided to peek in through the windows. And according to his testimony, he saw a parade of historical figures walking down the aisle of the chapel towards the altar. And at the very head of that ghostly pro uh, procession, which was lit by some kind of um, ethereal light, because the lights were out in the chapel, they glowed, according to what he said, um, was Anne Boleyn leading the procession. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've always loved that story. Mm -hmm. But the, the tower has many ghosts, um, some more concerning than others. One area, I don't know if you were able to go in there, but there is an area where there are um, various suits of king's armors and the armor of their horses, their battle mounts. I don't know if that was still there when you visited. Wasn't but there, there. Ah, okay. Well, there, there is reputed to have been um, a rather vicious attack upon a visitor in that area, as if the, something violent was mm -hmm. was in that particular section. Most of the tower's ghosts don't seem to be violent, however. Most of them seem to be more tragic, which when you consider how many people died there under tragic circumstances really makes sense. Um, mm -hmm. another, one, uh, another one that is kind of interesting is um, there was an incident where they had a pillar of light, like a glowing um, rod, that was seen by uh, one of the tower administrators and his family at the dinner table when flying around the room. There are so many wonderful pieces of, of paranormal history and legend that, uh, that are attached to that place. We really could mm -hmm. talk about them all night. Mm -hmm. Well, I did notice that. That was one of the things that I did feel once I walked in there. Like you mentioned, the tragic history. And there mm -hmm. is certain areas I noticed that the, the feeling of sadness is really, really intense. One of the things walking past Trader's Gate is mm -hmm. is one area where I could just feel the sadness. Um, I did concentrate a lot on climbing the wall all around and going through the areas um, like the, um, there is Salt like tower. a bedroom. Yes, yes, mm -hmm. yes. And just putting my hand on the walls where you see all of the um, carvings where people had carved their names while they were imprisoned. And just putting your hand on the wall and just feeling all of this. I mean, it's just a, a wonderful sense of touching history and feeling what these poor people felt, the terror, the sadness that they felt when they were imprisoned. I mean, this place is absolutely amazing. And it's to me, it's still very much alive. It's, it's amazing that right in the heart of London, and of course, as you look around from the tower, you see anchored across the Thames is a battle cruiser, HMS Belfast. But it's all steel and glass, isn't it? You've got modern 21st century London, and then right in the heart of it on the river, you have this historical anachronism, this place mm -hmm. um, of such misery and such kind of woe and pain. And yet it has, it, it's very odd. My wife and I, uh, we're not um, superstitious people. Um, we're, we're very pragmatic, and yet we always seem to be drawn back to the tower as though something mm -hmm. in there speaks to something in us. I don't mean literally, you know, but there's just something about the, the beauty of that building and the grounds. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, and I don't know what it is, but the history is so I, horrific. Go ahead. I agree totally. I mean, that's one location that I could not stay away. I was lucky enough to uh, have an apartment. I had a flat walking distance from the tower. And that's just one thing. I mean, twice, I could not stay away from it. I mean, it was just, I had to be there. I mean, it is, you're right, there is a pull there. Even though the history is just really dark and it's very horrific, yet there's still a pull. It's almost like I get the feeling that there are so many stories there where I don't think the full story has been given out. And I do believe that they're still trying to get someone to listen. I wouldn't bet against that at all. The um, the yeoman warders all have their own ghost stories too. And uh, 
they, they're very pragmatic individuals, as men and women both. They um, are all senior non-commissioned officers in the British Armed Services who have provided decades of exemplary service and risen um, in the ranks. So these are, you know, tough, no-nonsense individuals, and yet they're all very matter-of-fact about their experiences um, with, with ghosts in the tower and ghostly activity. Um, and one of them has written a book, uh, there are a couple of books actually, about the kind of ghost stories that are surrounding those, those parts of the tower. Uh, and what I find most interesting about them as witnesses, they are there 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They're always on guard. They're always on duty, and they live on site. And for mm-hmm. hundreds of years, they've had these ghostly uh, experiences. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is fascinating that there, here's this location right in the middle of modern London, and it's like setting foot back in time almost. Um, I'm very fascinated by the Tower Green and the glass monument uh, of where it's thought that Anne lost her head. Um, it is, until you get there and you actually sit there and try to absorb everything, it is absolutely fascinating. Now, have you ever experienced uh, anything while you were there? Not of the tower, no. Um, and I would love to move in there for a week. The problem with gaining any kind of access to the tower is, of course, that it is still very, very... Um, not only busy, but the crown jewels are there, you know. Yes. Um, the, the queen's, the, the monarch's um, jewelry worth, it's actually priceless because it couldn't mm-hmm. be replaced if it was stolen or lost. So, so they're very careful about who they allow in there and how. In fact, the ceremony of the keys, I don't know if you've ever seen that. Um, no. It's been going on for several hundred years. It, it happens at night. The omen warders um, transfer the keys over under guard. You have to apply in writing, not by email, but in writing, months in advance to be allowed to witness that ceremony. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. But that whole area of the Thames has its uh, has its ghost stories. It's so steeped in history. Mhm. Mhm. Well, you do talk about another location, um, London's Clink Prison Museum, in the book, and this is another location that has a very dark and horrific history, especially for the unfortunate that were sentenced to time there. Can you share with us what that was like, and what methods of investigating were you able to use when you were there, and what happened? So the the clink is something that I discovered entirely by accident. Um, you've heard the phrase thrown in the clink. We all have. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we just we just take it to mean it's a, it's a slang term for jail. I had no idea the clink was a real place. And so my wife and I were walking through this historic um, part of London one day, just going from point A to point B, because London is a fun city to wander around. You know, take mm-hmm. some dark streets and, and you'll come upon something historic at every turn. And we found the clink prison museum and there was a wax head impaled on the wall outside. And said, well, what's this? This looks awesome. And it turns out that the clink was a real prison in London. It is um, hundreds and hundreds of years old. And actually, there have been several because it's been, it's been burned down multiple times. Um, and it was one of the nastier prisons in London's red light area at the time. It isn't anymore. Um, it's a fairly nice area now with bars and restaurants and so forth in uh, Southwark. Southwark is the way it's uh, spelled. And um, it, they still have, um, you go downstairs, you can see how torture was conducted. You can speak to the local historian and um, hear stories of how people were just left to rot in the tank in sewage and flood water from the Thames. And uh, if you had money and you were jailed in there, you could actually have a pretty good, the guards were totally corrupt. And so, you know, you could go to the clink and live quite a decent life and, and buy any service or, or luxury you could afford. But if you had no money and you couldn't get out of the clink to work in order to get money, you would pretty much live and die um, there. And there were actually families and children were born in the clink. Entire mm-hmm. families lived and died within those walls. And so you have to go downstairs. It is a very... Um, kind of claustrophobic, dank, underground area. You go downstairs one level, and you basically are um, in a torture chamber. So there is a rack, there is a, a headsman's axe, and there are stocks, um, those kind of things. And 
it's a, now a prison museum, a medieval prison museum. And so I was fortunate enough to spend a night investigating the clink, um, which just to say you've been thrown in the clink is worth worth its weight in gold, isn't it? Um, yeah. And so we were investigating. <laughs> and the reason it got that name is the theory goes it's twofold. The one that seems most likely is that once they put the manacles on you, they would hammer a small iron pin to hold them in place so you couldn't get them off. And so the clink, clink, clink noise of them tapping the pin in with a hammer is how the prison was believed to get its name. Although there's also the theory that um, guards, prison guards, would um, make clinking noises on, on the iron of the cell grates, you know, the bars, and, mm-hmm. and kind of make that creaky noise. Um, but either way, it is the original clink where we get the term thrown in the clink. So just the history behind that place was phenomenal. So how did you get to spend the night there investi- and investigate? Actually, it's something that anybody can do um, if you time it right. Uh, there are There is a company called Haunted Happenings that will, will do that very thing. They'll get you the clink for the night and they'll get you access and you can conduct your own investigation. And so that's what I did. I flew over from the States to spend a night in the clink um, and had a great old time of it. We used some traditional techniques, you know, the the usual EMF meters and and those kind of things. And we also used some non-traditional techniques. It was my first experience with table tipping and dowsing rods and Ouija boards, stuff that honestly I um, had been very skeptical of. I uh, had a number of interesting experiences, which um, I'm not not ready to say they were paranormal, but certainly they were interesting. Um, one example was the Ouija board session in which rather than speak to anybody local, you know, any of the ghosts of the clink, it seemed that one of the sitters, one of my fellow teammates' um, father came through on the Ouija board. And she was absolutely convinced. There were tears streaming down her face. She was absolutely convinced that her own father was communicating with her through the Ouija board down there in the basement of the clink itself. And it was it was very emotional and moving. Well, you know what? I do want to ask you uh, about that. I mean, what do you think of the Ouija board as a tool for investigating now. I mean, Anthony and I, we see them just as that, as a tool. But there are many in the field that seem to be very, very afraid of them. I mean, what do you think now that you've had that experience? I mean, would you use one again when you investigate? I've heard many stories of investigators that I respect enormously um, having bad experiences with Ouija boards, whether it is mm-hmm. inviting something negative um, into environment or bringing some kind of attachment home with them. So honestly, we own a Ouija board, um, but I do not use it. It's it's actually my wife. It's a family heirloom. And I know that Mm -hmm. technically it's regarded as a toy, but uh, I'm not a big fan of tempting fate. And so if ever anybody asks me my advice about Ouija boards, again, it's all secondhand because I tend not to use them. Um, But people I respect and trust have told me steer clear of them or you will be sorry. And I tend to to follow that advice. That being said, though, there is a decent amount of research which suggests that in some cases, the Ouija board is is being, the planchette's being manipulated subconsciously by the sitters. I'm not saying that it's an attempt at fraud. I'm saying that Mm -hmm. micromuscular tremors in the fingers um, tend to move the planchette on occasion, and you can get intelligent responses from um, potentially your own subconscious. Mm-hmm. So I think I think it can be a genuine tool. It definitely has the potential, or seems to have the potential, to allow us to take with something. Now, whether that something is our own subconscious, whether that something is an external spiritual entity, is a question for debate. And I don't think the evidence is there to make a definitive conclusion. Okay. Well, what kind of things did you experience when you were there in the clink? So one thing that kind of fascinated me was uh, we experimented with dowsing rods. And dowsing rods are, again, something that I've heard good things about, but I don't know how they could possibly work. And so I was always very skeptical. So we decided to conduct an experiment with the rods. 
one of the um, investigators left the room and we decided we were going to have her douse for a personal object. She gave up her phone. And so we said we would put the phone somewhere in the room um, and we would see if she could douse her way to the phone. Now, unbeknownst to her, and because I'm not always a nice man, I took her phone and I stuck it in my hip. And so when she <laughs> okay. came in and began to douse, I would actually move around the room. And so the dowsing rods were leading her towards a position where I happened to be standing. And then I would move. And amazingly enough, those dowsing rods kept coming towards me. There was no way she could have known that I'd actually put that in my purse, about my person. You know, she'd been escorted from the room. The door was closed. Um, there was no way. And so after five or six times, she was confused and she kept saying, they're leading me over here, they're leading me over here. I just don't get this. And it was, she was following me around. So I actually found that very impressive. Mm-hmm. Um, yes. Yeah. Yeah, what we didn't run into, which I really would have liked to have, are any of the apparitions that are supposed to be, um, are supposed to haunt the clink. And one is a, a plague-era doctor, um, so several hundred years old, that is supposed to, to still remain after all those years. Did not experience him. But it was a very, um, I won't say frightening, but it was kind of an intimidating place to investigate because it's full of mannequins of witches, you know, and these old crones and hags, um, all these intimidating torturers and prisoners and inmates. So you're in the dark, and you're in the dark on what looks like the set of an old horror film. So you've really got to be careful that your imagination doesn't run away with you in a location like that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it sounds there are heads amazing. On oh, God. <laughs> That is absolutely amazing, and it's like definitely now you just put another location on my list. <laughs> well, you should definitely check out the clink. It's it's a great historic location. And the thing about paranormal research anyway is this. I've often said that 90% of the investigations we go on turn out to be fruitless, or at least we get no evidence of the paranormal. But just the, how awesome is it to spend time in some of these historic old locations, that alone makes it worth it. It's it's a great privilege. Yes, it is. Well, you know what? Just done, what I, something I want to bring up. I did hear you say in other interviews that you and your group you don't use psychic services when you're investigating, and you have said that it's non-reliable. Now, is this because mm-hmm. you haven't yet witnessed an authentic, true psychic? Or is it the whole idea of psychics not being believable? No, I haven't said that it's not reliable. What I said is that I haven't encountered yet a psychic that has delivered information that could not have been obtained by conventional means. And and it's worth just briefly discussing the nature of the word skeptic, because I do describe myself as a skeptic. But skeptic is a word that gets a bad rap in our community, isn't it? Because we tend to think... Skeptic means that no matter what you show me, I'm not going to believe it, you know? And that's not what it means. All skepticism is is saying we have some very extraordinary claims being made here. What's the evidence to support them? Because extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, you know? And so I I am waiting to be impressed by a psychic, and I'm certainly open to testing one. It's not that I won't use them. But what I won't do is is take a psychic that um, would get me information that easily is obtainable on Google and call that evidence. So there's a difference. Mm-hmm. And I do believe there are people out there with those genuine abilities, but I think it's also like um, panning for gold, you know? Um, mm-hmm. the, the truly genuine ones that are able to perform reliably and repeatedly are very, very rare. You know, so no mm-hmm. disrespect to the psychic community. It's not an ability that most seem to be able to turn on or off on demand. You know, um, my my technology, my recording equipment, I can turn on and off on demand, but I cannot do that. Psychics cannot do that um, with their talent, and that's kind of be frustrating for the genuine ones. Mhm. Well, you know, just like on that note, I mean, pretty much like 
Anthony's the one that has all the equipment. He he has all of the gadgets, the bells and the whistles. I tend to just use my recorder, and uh, I'm a big fan of the spirit box. I know that there is a uh, a portion of the community that really doesn't um, feel that the spirit box is a true communication device. But um, I forgot where I was going here. <laughs> oh, one of the, the, the pieces of equipment that we do use is the uh, ovulus, okay? Mm-hmm. I tend to have a little bit of skepticism with the ovulus. I mean, I know we've people use it in situations, and it seems that the answers that come through do pertain to maybe the location or some of the stories. But how do you feel about something like that, the ovulus, that, that has this database that we're saying that the spirit can learn to manipulate it and bring up words and communicate. Are you, how do you feel about that? I think that um, the ovulus is an interesting concept, but in order for it to work, in order for the ovulus to do what people or some people think it does, we're depending upon some kind of entity spirit, call it what you will, being able to manipulate um, electrical energy fields to a very fine degree and also to know which elements of that database the um, the energy values relate to. You know, which is, I've always thought that was a little bit of a stretch. However, mm-hmm. I absolute, one night I absolutely was kind of, my socks were knocked off by an obelisk. And I'll tell you for why. I was... Um, I think this story is in the book, In Search of the Paranormal. But I was on an investigation, a charity investigation, at, um, I believe it was the old governor's mansion in Denver. And the team had been experimenting with the ovulus, and I hadn't really paid much attention. And I went over to say hi to to my friend who was using the ovulus. And the the ovulus said, as soon as I walked over there, the ovulus said the word paramedic, which is kind of an odd word, you know, to use. And... I am a paramedic. It's my profession. And he said the ovulus had never used that word before, and it just happened to use it the moment a paramedic stepped within two feet. Mm-hmm. That seemed a little bit of a coincidence to me, you know? Um, mm-hmm. and, and, and a truly skeptical person, an uber skeptic, would say, yeah, well, even a stopped clock is right twice a day. Tells the correct time twice a day, you know? Mm-hmm. Um but it was a little near the mark for me. I kind of had that sensation of, wow, that was that was a real dinger. So that well, that I'm, is my obvious story that still impresses me. <laughs> <laughs> well, is there any particular piece of equipment that you favor? You know, I am not the biggest gadget head. I have a number of folks on my team that are and that, that have okay. spent the equivalent of the mortgage on buying the the investigative equipment. I, I'm i a big believer, though, in the old-fashioned approach that you can conduct a good investigation 100 bucks or less. So I do okay. like a good camera. I do like the ability to record video and high-definition still images. But honestly, I think most of the best investigation is done deductively. So... Okay. It would be nice to have the budget that TAPS have. It would be nice to kind of have that Hollywood dream budget of equipment. But I think there's a real danger then in getting caught up in the gadgets, caught up in the gear, and less in the human factors of the haunting. And that's where my fascination lies. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, that brings up my ne- next question. What are your thoughts on paranormal reality shows? I mean, have they created a culture that's based on non-scientific research or is it turning us uh, towards you know just relying on these gadgets and leaving the human factor of your senses out well that's a (laughs) that's kind of a loaded question if ever i heard one and i love it because (laughs) it's it's one of the most important questions facing our community right now isn't it Um, yes it is it's a double it's a double-edged sword and I'll, i'll say that i really do enjoy some of those shows um, they are my guilty pleasure shows, you know. Um, I'll I'll watch them with um, <laughs> usually when my wife is out, you know. <laughs> so my wife is going out for a couple of hours. I'll watch one of those shows. <laughs> She'll come back in and say, "What are you watching? Nothing, nothing." <laughs> you know. But 
I, I always describe them as location porn, if you'll pardon, pardon the term. They get into yes. the most incredible places. Now, the methodology is what I argue with. So, for example, I don't like taunting. I really don't. I think it's disrespectful, and I'm not willing to do it, and I will not allow my team to do it. And you, you see some investigators, quote-unquote, on TV, behaving in an almost verbally abusive way, don't you? Yeah. And I think that, show, that shows us in a bad light. And if that were one of my relatives that were deceased and somebody were talking to them like that, I would not find that acceptable at all. But mm-hmm. ratings are key. And this is, again, something I've said several times in interviews. If you look at the earlier seasons of some of those shows, they were very clear about the fact that, hey, we didn't find anything at all. We found no evidence to support the possibility that your place is haunted. It doesn't mean that it isn't. It just means that we couldn't prove it. And as, as the show started to get into their latest seasons and the pressure to deliver ratings, I assume, um, is what caused this change, suddenly every property every week, almost at least, seems to have its ghosts. You know, or in certain shows, it has dark demonic entities because, hey, they sell better, right? Mm-hmm. So, so I think the penchant for drama, the penchant for the the dark, scary, creepy music, and the penchant for showing the, you know, uh, you'll see people in makeup with the most. I think that it does us no favors as a profession when people think that's how we investigate. Because I can't speak for you. But I am not yelling and screaming and swearing at spirits and telling them to come attack me. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. No, that's one thing that we, uh, I definitely agree with you on. We do not taunt. Um, I, it just seems, I, I agree, it seems very disrespectful. And again, we don't really know what we're dealing with. Um which leads me to a question that just came up in my mind. You know, a lot of people, they're fascinated by the dark. They're fascinated by the negative. And you always hear the word demon, demonic uh, mm-hmm. entity. What is your feeling on things such as demons? I mean, do we really come in contact with things like this as often as the show seem to hint at? Well, I think that... Um Demon is a term that is it's dependent upon your world view, isn't it? Uh, we all investigate from our own, through the, through the prism of our own belief system. And I have investigators that are Catholic, you know, so Christian investigators. I have investigators that are, um, I have investigators that are agnostic and atheist, various faiths, various beliefs. And I think no matter how objective we try to be, we always bring some of that to the table, you know? So I'm not sure that I'm a fan of the term demon because of of what it implies. I think that there is undoubtedly violent paranormal activity. Now, whether that is something non-human that is trying to cause harm or whether it is something that is trying to draw attention to itself, the only means it knows how, is, I think, a cause of some debate. It's a subject that, that we could definitely talk about further, you know? Um mm-hmm. But not everything that makes a noise and bangs and scratches is malevolent. I think it's easy for us to to try and spin everything in that light. And that's what sells, unfortunately. You know, that's where the ratings are. If you look at uh, Hollywood and its experiences with the paranormal, all of the, the real money, all of the real profits are in movies like The Conjuring. They're not so mm-hmm. much telling, you know, with, with a few exceptions, and not so much telling stories about the afterlife being nice and ghosts being pleasant or misunderstood. They're telling these dark, malevolent tales to frighten because that's what entertainment is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Now, I agree totally. I think um, media really does influence a lot of what we look for, and I think it influences a lot of what people think they're experiencing. It, it most definitely does. And, and I'm as guilty as anyone. Of, I love a good um, horror movie, a good scary movie, you know. I thought, for example, Insidious was great. But you have mm-hmm. to recognize that it's fiction. It's not a true reflection on what we do. You know, and it's and it's important to, to kind of recognize that. Um, 
I, I'm a volunteer firefighter. Backdraft is not a accurate reflection of, of that profession, you know? Uh-huh. Uh-huh. It's Hollywoodized. Um, and when Hollywood gets its hand its hands into something like this, it delivers the product it thinks that the audience wants to see. And the problem with reality shows is that I don't know how much of them is actually reality. I mm-hmm. think that some of them are ke- very carefully scripted to tell a spooky story. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and the problem is that, and I've been asked a couple of times, hey, if they offered you your own um, ghost hunting show, reality show, would you take it? Um, and I think the idea is very seductive. The problem is that if you did it properly and accurately, it'd be the most boring show on TV. <laughs> because as you, yeah. as you well know, and as your audience well know, you can't show 19 hours of people doing research and waiting for something to happen. <laughs> you know, that's not a ratings winner. So if you took a year of my investigations, I'd say you'd maybe get a couple of hours of usable TV out of what actually is paranormal there. We we spend mm-hmm. a lot of time for very little reward, I think. And of course we do yeah. because we're fascinated and passionate. We're, we're not doing it for cheap thrills. Mm-hmm. Exactly, exactly. Now you did mention that, that you know you're you're a firefighter. Um, I believe uh, you are an EMT paramedic. Is that correct? Yeah, I'm a paramedic also. Okay. Now, does having an occupation like that does that cross over in any way or influence your paranormal investigating? And not so much my investigate. Well, actually, it's a benefit in terms of the way I approach investigations. So. I always, um, in a very respectful way, I always ask the clients who are experiencing this phenomena, I ask them about their medical history and I ask them about their medications because there are many medications and conditions which can cause um, hallucinations that can interfere with the brain, the biochemistry, and perhaps make you prone to either experiencing um, things that aren't actually happening to you or possibly Mm -hmm. make you more sensitive to something that is genuinely going on, you know. So I found the answers to some cases in a client's medical history. Um, Mm -hmm. As a firefighter, I have to understand building construction. Uh, That's a huge part of our our knowledge base. So knowing how a slightly sloping floor grade can cause things to move, how air flows through a building, how a building contracts at night when the weather gets cold and expands and makes noises when it starts to warm up, Those are all very valuable um, areas of expertise to have. Mm -hmm. So it's definitely more than just picking up the camera and and a recorder and just heading out to a location. Absolutely. And I think that paranormal tourism is becoming um, rather a big thing. And, And this is certainly true in the UK. It's definitely true in the States as well. You know, folks are paying a healthy fee to go visit some of these places and quote unquote investigate them. Now, um, it's not something I've done a great deal of and whenever I've done it, I can count on two fingers the number of times that's happened. I always do it for um for a charity. In fact, the Long One Humane Society is my chosen charity, you know. But I don't fool myself that um the data that's gathered on those investigations is anything like as valuable as it is when we control the whole building and we mm-hmm. don't have members of the public accompanying us because you have with the greatest of respect to them folks who are setting out to have a paranormal experience it's what they want to do and they will try they will interpret pretty much anything in that light there's very Mm -hmm. little skepticism there there's very little objectivity and i think that taints the data that's gathered Mm, okay well you know, out of the locations that you've investigated, I know you've investigated in England, you've investigated here in mm-hmm. the States. Is there one experience that has really frightened you or made you think twice about what you're doing? Not with the paranormal, but with living people. <laughs> um, <laughs> I've, I've always said you should you should be more afraid of the living than you are of the dead. Um, and that's absolutely true, especially in in modern society, but I'll never forget the old gentleman up at a um, a haunted theater in the mountains um, that turned up at just before midnight at the door. He was dressed as a cowboy, um, 
and he thought we were cooking meth, if you can believe that, in the old oh building. God. And so when we explained to him that we were there with the permission of the owners and that we'd already notified the police, um, he was very nice and friendly. <laughs> he was packing a gun and had said that in this town we know how to get rid of the bodies. You're lucky you're not fucking meth, boy. Oh you know, so it's, it's stuff like that that tends to frighten me. I think with the with the paranormal itself, we have a tendency to be afraid, and partly it is, again, those Hollywood movies, right? The, mm-hmm. the whole jump scare and those kind of things. But what we really are doing is we're investigating a very natural phenomenon that our, our branches of, of the sciences, such as physics, don't yet understand, you know? Um, I'm a firm believer that a few hundred years from now, the stuff we consider supernatural or paranormal, rather, is going to be as everyday as x-rays are today. It's mm-hmm. pretty remarkable you can go to a hospital or go to a dentist and get images taken inside your body. And if you were if you were somehow able to bring your great-great-great-grandparents to see this, they would consider it witchcraft. They would consider it magic, wouldn't they? Because yeah. it's beyond their frame of reference. Right now, of course, if you want an x-ray, you can go get one with no problem. And I think that's purely because our understanding of science is advanced to this point. I think that our understanding of, of science needs to advance significantly in order for us to understand ghosts, hauntings, the paranormal phenomena that we're all so interested in. But we will get there one day. And I think that when that happens, one of the most attractive things is people like you, people like myself, my team, people like your listeners, that are doing the research right now. There are no great big academic studies going on into the paranormal. You know, you don't see um, PhDs in lab coats going out and spending time in haunted buildings investigating claims. It's the guy and gal in the street, people like us, that are doing all of the field work. And I think that one day when they finally um, break open the the truth about what, what it is we're investigating, those investigators or those scientists, those physicists, whoever, will have been standing on our shoulders. And I find that very exciting. It's a community where we can all contribute to the long-term scientific discovery that will happen one day. That's excellent. I mean, I do agree. So with that in mind, where do you see paranormal investigating going for us, the ones that actually want to go out and actually want to find these answers. Is it going to be would, easier, would, easier for us? You know, I'm not sure. I would really like to see some kind of um, standardization or accreditation. Uh, one mm-hmm. of the reasons that we are not respected as a profession is, and I've talked about this in other interviews, so forgive me if you've heard it before, but um, if you were to call right now, if you were to call for a plumber um, or if you were to call for an ambulance for the paramedic or if you were to call... Um, an attorney for their services, those are all professions where there are professional standards. And if this is a certified professional, you can expect them to have a minimum skill set, you know? Whether Mm -hmm. it's a lawyer that has passed the bar exam or a paramedic that that is nationally certified as a paramedic, um, most of the professions have certification and regulating bodies. We don't have that. So you can call yourself a paranormal investigator by simply printing up business cards and setting up a free website. It doesn't make you one. It doesn't make you a a reliable one. Um, So I'd like to see the community get together and say we should have before they should be able to truly call themselves a paranormal investigator. You know, Mm -hmm. what should their understanding be? And I think that if we could agree upon that and if we could set some standards, we could actually gain a little bit more respect um, as a profession. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, you know, because we all go out and we all investigate and everyone has different experiences. Everyone has mm-hmm. different uh, activity. And it seems like everyone is searching for that one thing that's going to have everyone turn the attention towards them. And that's the not really... Trail. Yeah, you know, but that's not really what's happening. It seems like a lot of times there's so much um, disagreement and people look at it evidence and, you know, oh, that's not real or, you know, when in actuality they're all bits and pieces of the big answer. 
it's the old story, isn't it, of the blind men trying to describe an elephant by touch. So one touches the trunk, one touches the feet, one touches the tail, and they're all describing something completely different, and they argue. But in reality, I think that we talk about ghosts, and we use the word ghosts or spirits. It's an umbrella term, you know? There is no one explanation fits all for what we're investigating. I think that we have those interactive hauntings where we can communicate, you know, where we get EVPs that answer questions directly. We get those other types of hauntings where the phenomena seems more like a recording, almost like a movie, you know, or um, uh, the soundtrack on the CD where it's just playing over and over and over again over the years. And then we get the poltergeist, which is its own subset of phenomena, you know, and there are the crisis apparitions, apparitions of the living. There are various different subsets. And I think we all need to need to agree on terms a little bit more um, rather than just trying to find one answer which fits everything. I don't think mm-hmm. there is a theory of everything for the paranormal. Okay. One of the things that we did talk about, one of the things that we find we've found in our own investigation, and we we've mentioned it a couple times, is this invisible web that connects everything. That you know, some evidence that you find here or some kind of experience, they all seem to have this web that connects. You know, you experience something here, and for some reason, it may attach itself to another investigation you may have. Do you feel mm-hmm. that's the case where there's this, there's this underlying web of connection? I think it's certainly possible. I don't know that I've seen enough evidence of it that I would say it definitely happens, but I'm certainly possibility. Um, we seem to attract coincidences a great deal in this field, don't we? Yes. Um, you know, and, and I'm a big believer that coincidence only goes so far there comes a point at which uh, coincidence is a ridiculous conclusion to come to, that you have to jump to so many, jump through so many different hoops in order to call it a coincidence that the paranormal explanation is actually the more logical one. Mm -hmm. Well, is there a location, you know, either here in England that you absolutely love? I mean, has there been an active location that you've experienced things or your team has that you that you want to go back or you, is there some something on your bucket list? Is there a location that you want to investigate? Oh, boy. My bucket list <laughs> is huge. Um, certainly here in the United States, I would like to do the, the St. Augustine Lighthouse in uh-huh. um, Florida. You know, that is a very impressive location. Plus, lighthouses are just cool. Um, and and the same goes for the Queen Mary, of course, which is, I know it's a hotel. I would like to spend a night investigating the swimming pool in the Queen Mary, uh, which has been paranormal active for many, many years, of course. Um, in the UK, there are several. The one that interests me is in Pontefract, 30 East Drive in Pontefract, which... Um, there was a very famous poltergeist uh, outbreak there 30 or 40 years ago. Um, and they made a movie about it, which was not too bad, called When the Lights Went Out. I don't know if you've seen that. No, I haven't. Uh, it's definitely worth looking at. Um, but they had, again, a, a very... This did seem like a rather dark case. And the inhabitants of the house, even to this day, say that they experienced phenomena, which is which is rather disturbing. Um, and the Enfield House, the, the Enfield Poltergeist Home, which um, also is steeped in, in history, steeped in legend, um, they just made a, a mini-series about that called The Enfield Haunting, which was really rather exaggerated and disowned by the gentleman that uh, that wrote the book. The book itself about that investigation, This House is Haunted, is the name of the book, by Guy Playfair, is one of the best accounts of a paranormal investigation I've ever seen because he and his mm-hmm. partner moved in basically with that family for many, many months. And they experienced the highs and lows of this poltergeist infestation or outbreak, for want of a better word. Um, they were in at the beginning and they were there when it finally went away after a visit from a medium. So those those properties are all on my bucket list. Um, and one day I'm sure I'll get to some of them. Mm-hmm. 
Well, is there any location or uh, activity that you uh, – this is one thing that, that kind of always is in the back of my mind, that when an, uh, when we go in to investigate, is it possible mm-hmm. that we can make things worse? Is it possible that we can maybe make the activity increase because of what we're doing? because of going in there. And it's almost like, you know, leave a, a sleeping dog's lie. But when you go in there and you wake them up, is it possible that we can wake something up? I think it's a concern. And whenever I talk to a client, I always tell them very frankly before I go near their home that there are no guarantees and it's entirely possible because we don't know what we're dealing with that we could make things better, that we might not have any effect at all, or we could stir something up and make it more active. Now, I think you mitigate that risk by being as respectful as possible. So um, I recently investigated with some colleagues Bobby Mackey's Music World, which I'm sure you're familiar with, Mm -hmm. um, in in Wilder, Kentucky. Supposedly one of the most, um, the phrase has been used by by numerous investigators, supposedly one of the most demon-infested locations in the world. Um, and we had an extremely quiet night there. Uh, in fact, I was stealing myself for this to be um, a frightening evening, and it was actually very pleasant and quiet. Uh, mm-hmm. And in talking with um, one of the local investigators, she told me that the groups that experience just spectacular activity there tend to be those that provoke um in a religious way. So the the teams that will bring in Bibles and crucifixes as control objects, you know, religious iconography, mm-hmm. they tend to be the ones that stir the activity up and make the place restless. So I, I did think that was quite interesting. Well, we have we have investigated Bobby Mackey's twice and both okay. experiences were completely different from from each other. The first one, we did go with the team that we had, and we did have one member of the team that did that, you know, uh, asked to be um, scratched and, and asked, you know, was, was pretty much just saying things that really you shouldn't be saying. And it, it turned out that Anthony did get scratched, and it was, mm-hmm. it was pretty pretty intense. Now, the second mm-hmm. time, um, going back to what you were saying about, you know, the land and everything, um, Wanda Kay, who was, was doing the, the tours at that time, had given me information and part of my research, you know, it's Cherokee land. So the second time when we went, before we started our investigation, being Cherokee, I asked if it was okay if I could make an offering of tobacco, which mm-hmm. I did. And I went in and I, you know, just made the offering, left a few cigarettes here and there, went around the building and asked them. I asked permission for my team to come in and to be able to talk, communicate. The second second investigation was completely different. It was calm. It was was nice. Um, We did have an experience where Anthony's phone started playing music that wasn't – he had never downloaded it, but it was a beautiful – Calming. It was it, it was a um, song, and it was something. Uh, I believe the the name of it was something uh, Requiems for a Princess or something. But it was just the experience was completely different from the first time. And you know, of course, Bobby Mackey's and their reputation for how negative it is. The first time we went, yes, it was like that. But the second time, mm-hmm. after making the offering and asking for permission. It was actually yeah. almost a pleasant experience. And that's how we kind of described it. And, uh, again, we're back to the media because the way that Bobby Mackey's is portrayed in the media has been very – it's amazing there hasn't been a horror movie made about that place yet, isn't it? Um, mm-hmm. And yet when you when you go in respectfully, when you go in with a level head, um, and when you go in with, um, I think, good intent, you have a much better chance of having a positive experience. Now, the thing is, we had a, as you described it, I would agree with you, um, we had a, a good night. It was nice. The atmosphere was very pleasant. That's generally not why people go to that location, though. Right. Um, and so I think that, that that may sour some people on it. I would like to go back. Um, but again, 
I still would not conduct the the aggressive provocation that seems to get results there. I just think it's a price I don't want to pay. Mm, okay. You know, while I've got you here, I do have mm. to ask you, <coughs> excuse me, there is a location in England, the, the, the city of York, that I really, oh, yeah. really want to go to. And mm. my interest is coming from the history of the location of, of all the deaths that happened during the reign of Henry the Henry VIII, I want to go there. Do you know anything about York and, and you know, what should I be looking for? York is, is widely regarded as, as it had the claim to be the world's most haunted city. I don't know if that's the case or not. I know that a lot of the hauntings there are very um, historical. You know, so so we have hauntings there that talk about Roman soldiers being seen. Mm-hmm. So what you should look for in York really is is go to the more historic um, quarters of, of York. Go to um, uh, some of the locations that are not quite as modern. One of the the great, and if you Google York, um, you'll you'll see a lot of claims of it being the most haunted city in England, in Europe, if not the world. Uh, and, and one survey that I looked up said that York supposedly had 500 documented cases of hauntings. And most of them are the Black Swan Inn is in York, which is a very haunted pub. Should definitely go there. Um, places places that have a lot of history. And Romans. York was a huge um the Romans had a large presence in that city. And so a mm-hmm. lot of the apparitions are Roman legionaries, Roman soldiers. Um including the most famous one. And I forget which what the exact name of the building was, but it was something like a government building. Uh, a workman was in the basement of this building, and I'll see if I can find it as we're talking, uh, and saw a bunch of Roman soldiers, including an officer on horseback, come through the wall of the cellar. It's the treasurer's house in York. Um, I'm just looking it up right now as we're talking. This is 1953, and it's a fairly famous case. And what was kind of fascinating about it is, Remembering that this was, of course, long before the Internet and, and so forth, you know, when we couldn't get information as easily, um, this gentleman, a plumber called Harry Martindale, was working in the cellars of the treasurer's house, supposed to be very haunted, and he saw this unit of Roman soldiers, including the horses, that would come through, actually walk through a wall. And one thing that was that was odd, he described it afterwards, and he said, yeah, they had um, round shields. And if you watch, you know, on TV, we look at Romans, they have, they're famous for having those very tall square shields, you know, the ones mm-hmm. that are about four feet high and square. Every Hollywood movie, you look at Romans in it, they've got those square shields. And he said, no, 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 these guys definitely had round shields. So he kind of got laughed at for it, although there have been other sightings of these same Roman ghosts. He talked to a historian who said, oh, well, you'll find that a lot of the local Roman troops here, the local garrison, weren't from Rome. They were kind of um, hired mercenaries by Rome. They were local lads or um, foreign units, and they didn't have the traditional square shields. They would probably have had these round shields that militia units had. So it was a piece of, of trivia that this historian knew that Harry Martindale couldn't have known. And so mm-hmm. that kind of lent a lot of credence to his sighting. Um, but this is a an apparition that has been seen several times over the years in the same location. The curator of the house also saw the Roman soldiers. A number of people have seen them. Wow, that's amazing. I really do want to go there. I mean, that is one of the locations that's on my list. But you know what? Let's get back to your book. It is getting very good reviews. And is there one thing that you want your readers to take away after they read it? One take-home message after they read it? Um, yes. You know, if, if I can be greedy and, and give two, would that be cool? Okay. And, That's I, I, fine. and I'll tell you why. So the, the first the first take-home point I'd like them is this. If you're going to investigate the paranormal, I encourage you to share your reports. Share them online. Um, the more data we have as a community that is reliable, that is um, well-researched, well-documented, I think the sooner we will get to that final 
um, understanding of what it is we're investigating, you know? The more reports we have, the better we can um, document them, that we can report them, I think can only benefit us as a profession. So if you enjoy reading in search of the paranormal, go out and investigate cases yourself and then share those stories, share the results of your investigations with the rest of us. I'd love to read them. In fact, if you bounce over to my website at richardestep.net, um, I'd love to read your reports. You can certainly read some of mine online at bouldercountyparanormal.org. Um, the, the more sharing we do of information and data, the better, mm -hmm. I think. And so that's the main take-home point that I would give people is, as a community, you know, we can benefit one another by sharing our reports and methodologies. I don't know if you would agree. Yes, yes, because that's how that's how we learn and I think we do need to learn from each other. I don't think any one person has the end all um information. Again, it's through sharing and through documenting what you're finding. Um I do want to mention that you do have other books and one mm -hmm. the, the one that I'm really waiting for is the one that I, I believe it's still being uh, it's uh, scheduled to be released is on haunted hospitals. That's There's right, something. the world's most haunted hospitals. Yes, is there something about hospitals that seem to lend itself towards um, activity? I mean, I mean, you do realize. I mean, everyone realizes that this is where life starts. There's birth. There's death, but. Is mm -hmm. there something in particular that these locations seem to absorb this activity, and why do you think that is? Well, I've always, if you look at the the paranormal literature, I think that emotion tends to be the link between um, a place and a haunting. So sometimes it's really positive emotion. You know, somebody loved a place very much during their lifetime, and part of them remains behind afterwards, um, or they drop back in to visit. You know, those are the kind of happy ghosts. And, and the one I told you about, the old lady at my stepfather's house, seems to be one of those types. She was, you know, grounded or attracted to the family life that was going on in the home she'd lived in and loved during her lifetime. Again, very strong emotion. And then on the flip side, of course, we have those places where we have um, negative emotion. So we have pain. We have um, abuse, frustration, rage. That's why so many battlefields, I think, have their ghost stories. And mm -hmm. a hospital has both of those in spades, doesn't it? It has um, the joy of childbirth, as you said. You have new life born. You have happy families. And then just rooms away, sometimes just feet away, you have death and you have disease. You have people saying goodbye to their loved ones. You have tragedy. You have trauma. So emotion, emotion, emotion. And again, you have all that going on um, within the same space for years and if not years, generations. I looked at hospitals around the world. Some of London's hospitals are hundreds of years old. You know? Um, and one ghost in St. Thomas's Hospital, the Grey Lady, which is believed to be the ghost of Florence Nightingale, who is one of the mothers of, um, of the nursing profession, she has en been encountered by generations of doctors and nurses. Mm -hmm. And what is it that fuels that activity? I think it's this constant influx of emotional energy going on within um, within those locations. You know, people are born, people die. All of the drama of life, because, you know, life is essentially drama, isn't it? They say drama is life with the dull bits cut out. So mm -hmm. all of the dramas of life, the intense highs and lows of emotional um, peaks and troughs, occur in hospitals on a daily basis, it would be a miracle if they weren't haunted. And what mm -hmm. I found, so I'd always, I'd always wanted to write on that subject, and hospital administrators do not like ghost stories. Um, I found that pretty much every hospital has one. Um, and the main reason the hospital administrators, quite understandably, don't like these stories to be publicized is that the hospital's supposed to be a place of calmness and rest and healing and recuperation, they don't want people being afraid. And so they are kind of suppressed. But if you do talk to doctors or if you look at some of the abandoned hospitals around the world, you find that there are some really interesting ghost stories attached to them. And I've, I've set out to document just a few of those in the world's most haunted hospitals. That will be out in January. 
That's excellent. I can't wait for that one. Um, one last question that I really, really um, want to ask you. With your investigating mm. and with, you know, uh, delving into the locations and that, has this has this um, changed your opinion about death in any way? In terms of do I believe more in life after death? Yes. Is that what you're asking? Well, yes. I think a combination of that and my profession have. I tend to see more than my fair share of dead people, as you would imagine. Um, and so a lot of the mystery and the, um, the, 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 I hate to say spooky, you know, but a lot of the kind of dark creepiness of death is not something that medical professionals hang on to for very long. We get to see it in a very matter-of-fact kind of way. Um, and I also have talked to more than my share of um, hospice workers, so doctors and nurses that work at the end of life. And it's it's amazing how many of them report their patients and the families of their patients, and sometimes themselves, having experiences which strongly suggest that there is a life after this one. So I think once you start looking at the, the frontiers of death, once you start talking to people that work there and, and live there on a daily basis, there is a fairly decent stack of evidence to suggest that part of us survives. Whether it's our personality in its entirety, I don't yet know, and I think we'll all find out one day, but I am convinced that part of us goes on, survives, and in some cases can not only manifest in the physical world here, but can be communicated with. Excellent. Yeah, yeah I, I do agree. I mean, it has changed the way that I look at the afterlife, and I truly believe that there is one. And mm -hmm. I think they're the ones that will get those answers. I don't think we'll truly ever get the real answer until we're on the other side. But it's not going to stop me from trying to find it. You know? Well, and and you may well be right and you may not. I don't know. There may well be a day when we're able to communicate in that way by by using some kind of device. Or it may be that whatever barrier, veil, call it what you will, between the two states of existence is not something that we can bridge. But what I would love to remind you, um, if you'll forgive me, is scientists said that the sound barrier could never be broken, could never be breached, that it was a, a barrier that was um, unbeatable. You know, we would always have to travel slower than the speed of sound. And it was not that long before they were proved wrong. It's amazing mm -hmm. what science has declared to be impossible over the years, which we then found out how to, how to fix, how to do, how to achieve. And so right now we consider this to be kind of impossible, you know, that we, we really can't know these kind of secrets and know these kind of things. And with our present level of understanding and frame of reference, that's true. But I do wonder if um, our descendants whether it is 100 years from now or 1,000 years from now, whether they won't find um, this level of knowledge to be something they take for granted, As, you know, in the same way that we consider our understanding of, of how the moon um, isn't a big ball of cheese in the sky, how it's actually a big rock and, and that kind of stuff. The things we once believed, the superstitions we once believed now seem laughable to us, don't they? We think we are yes. so enlightened. But in reality, if we go a thousand years down the line, I, I suspect that we'll be laughed at for believing in ghosts and goblins. You know, <laughs> they used to believe in, in ghosts and demons. They didn't understand it was just the next state of human consciousness or the next um, energy shift. Um, call it what you will. I think, though, it will become an everyday piece of understanding on a long enough time frame. And that's exciting, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Well, you know what, um, Richard, it's been fascinating so far learning about you and the, the, the way you investigate and the, some of the stories that you share. But you did mention that you had a particular charity that you, uh, I, I did. That you have. Can you tell us a little that, bit about it? Yeah, thank you so much for that opportunity. So anybody that buys in search of the paranormal, I am donating 10% of my royalties to the Code Green campaign. Um, they do excellent work. Code Green is talking about a situation that is it's becoming more and more common here in the in the US and throughout the world the world in general. First responders, so 
police officers, firefighters, EMTs, paramedics, emergency dispatchers, we are committing suicide in record numbers. Um, it is an epidemic. It's a mental health crisis. Um, PTSD is a large part of the reason. Uh, and we are also really, really bad at reaching out for help. The people that go out and help others, we're dreadful at asking for help for ourselves. And far too many of us are, are killing ourselves. You know, we're reaching for guns mm -hmm. and pills and, and so forth. And it's tragic. So the Code Green campaign is a charity which helps Firstly, the awareness of those issues raises awareness and also helps responders get the resources so that they can get the help they need, that they can reach out and get the help they need. So um, by purchasing In Search of the Paranormal, you are helping support the Code Green campaign, and I thank you in advance if you do that. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Um, where can our listeners go to learn more about you and to buy your wonderful books? Uh, do please come by and see me at richardestep.net. I'll post that in the chat room again also, richardestep.net. That's my online home. And I love to get email um, from people that want to talk about their ghost stories, want to talk about my books, or just talk about anything. Um, I love to be interactive and talk about the state of the field of paranormal research. Excellent. Well, you know what, Richard? We will be sure to check out the website at richardestep.net. And again, thank you so much for coming on the show. And we would love to have you back, especially when the book uh, on the hospitals are uh, is published. I, I'm really, truly fascinated by that. And again, I want to thank you so much for joining us. Oh, it's been a pleasure. And uh, if you give me a shout uh, closer to January, I'll be happy to come back if you would like. Excellent. We'll do that. All right. Have a wonderful weekend, and thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. Have a good night, and good night to all of your listeners. Bye-bye. Okay. So that is Richard Estep, and his book is called In Search of the Paranormal. And we didn't get into a whole lot of the stories that uh, he has in there, but you know what? It is absolutely fascinating. Um, some of the stories, and, you know, for me, of course, I love England. I love, I love the hauntings there. That's kind of what got my uh, interest in it, but... He does talk about a lot of the things that he's experienced here with his team. And one of the things that crossed my mind, I mean, you know, it's like as a country, we're really not that old. You know, a lot of the things that we experience, they are here. But when you look at uh, especially England, you know, the history is there. there there's much more. I mean, he's talking about Roman soldiers that are appearing. And in the city of London, there is still a wall that was built by the Romans, and unfortunately, I wasn't able to go there. Um, I was too fascinated by the tower. But just the thought of being able to touch something that was built so long ago, and we all feel, you know, I, I do in particular, I feel like the ground, the earth, the earth does remember. And when you're talking about buildings, locations, um, Gettysburg, I mean, you know, I'm going to get Anthony there sooner or later. We are going there. When you think about all of the things that have happened in a particular location, no matter what you build on top of it, that energy is still there. And I think that's one of the fascinating things about what we do. So it was an absolute pleasure talking to Richard and just getting an idea of how a different team, you know, someone else investigates. And some of the things that he talked about, I think we all do agree. You know, um, paranormal TV shows, we've said it over and over. I mean, what you see on TV isn't exactly the way it is, and that's something that we have to take into account. And who knows? The answers are out there. We just have to keep searching for them. So... Let's move on and let's go to some business. Let's go to the Paranormal Review Radio Fan of the Week. And this week, it is Alan Jacobson of Fresno, California. Alan, some of his likes, he likes The Walking Hunters, Ghost Adventures, Dark Shadows, The Dead Files, and Cosmo. Cosmos. He also likes Cindy Lauper, Kylie Minogue, Missy Elliott, who is making her return, Cher, and Lady Gaga. 
Alan left a very nice comment on our memorial show from Mark and Debbie Constantino. And we do want to thank you, Alan, for the kind words and thanks for listening. Um, Alan did thank us for the event. He says that he hopes to become a member of the paranormal community. He's seen the Constantinos on TV. The interview and the tribute was wonderful, and he said thank you. Um, He hopes and wishes for healing for everyone affected by their loss. So, again, Alan, thank you so much for understanding. Thank you for listening, and congratulations. And don't forget, if you want to be a Paranormal Review Radio Fan of the Week, just like us on Facebook, like uh, one of our posts, leave a comment, send us an email. You can find us on Twitter. You can find us on Tumblr. And, of course, you can find us on YouTube. Okay? So hauntings, they do occur all over the world. You know, we have so many locations here at home that we investigate. And they provide us with connections to the other side. Um what we experience here is no different from the rest of the world, except the spirits might be a lot older. It was so great to hear about some of the things in England. So we hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. And let me know when you're planning that trip to England because I want to go with you. Okay. (laughs) So next week, let's talk about that. It has been four years that Paranormal Review Radio has been on the air And I just got to say, it has been an honor and a pleasure to connect with all of you and with all of the many guests that we have spoken with. There's been so many topics that have led to the invisible web that seems to connect them all. And I know I talk about that a lot, but I really believe it. There's so many questions that still need to be answered, and we want to continue the conversation with the many brilliant minds in our field. So please join us next Friday night as we celebrate four years of Paranormal Review Radio with all of you, our friends. You've become more than just listeners. You are absolutely friends, and we treasure every single one of you. We want to thank you, everyone, for being the best fans on the, uh, on the planet. And, of course, Anthony will be back with us next Friday night. We want to say, again, happy birthday to Miliana, M- Melania. And so... Until next week, dear friends. Well, I do want to thank you for putting up with me tonight by myself. Um, So until next week, dear friends, keep your minds open and have a paranormal week. Good night, everybody. gotten into you well i don't mean the hashtag humble brag but now that i have 50 percent more data from at&t i can do 50 percent more of almost anything like share 50 percent more hashtags for the same price tag post 50 percent more of my highs all for the low and with 15 gigs for the same price as 10 i can stream even more insta goodness <laughs> you mean stream more cat videos no i mean 50 percent more At AT AT&T, you can now get 15 gigabytes for the price of 10. That's 50% more data. Plus, get unlimited talk and text to Mexico and Canada. 
Limited time offer. Previous mobile share value 10 gigabyte plan to new 15 gigabyte one. Must sign up for new plan. Includes calling and texting from the U.S., Puerto Rico, and the U.S. Virgin Islands to Mexico and Canada. Paper use rates apply to cost to other countries. Restrictions apply. See a store for plan details.